In search of security, rival factions and foreign powers talk stability in Tripoli, but can they unite a country so divided by war in time to hold elections? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is the effort to stabilize Libya. A decade of war and division has ravaged Libya. Attempts to create a functional unified government have proven hugely challenging, but still, rival powers have come together in Tripoli this week to try to stabilize the country. Without it, much anticipated elections scheduled for December are unlikely to happen. At September's UN General Assembly, the head of Libya's Presidency Council, Mohamed Al Menfi, said they were at a critical juncture and warned if elections weren't held soon, there would be further chaos and conflict. This is a defining moment. We either succeed in the democratic transition by means of free, fair, transparent elections, the results of which are acceptable to all, then move towards a sustained stability and prosperity, or we fail and relapse into division and armed conflict. And one month later, Libya is hosting officials from the EU, Turkey and the U.S. to garner support for the proposed polls. The stabilization conference in Tripoli coincides with the 10-year anniversary of the death of Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi. After 42 years in power, it was hoped his demise would bring about the change so many Libyans were looking for. Instead, after tribal forces backed by NATO came together to topple Gaddafi, the country descended into civil war. But in March last year, there was some progress on the road to peace. After warlord Khalifa Haftar's attempt to take Tripoli failed, the United Nations was finally able to broker a ceasefire. An interim unity government was formed, replacing the UN-backed government of National Accord in the West and the rival House of Representatives in Tobruk in the East. Its job was to create stability as Libya prepared for elections. But it was never going to be easy. Just last month, the Eastern Parliament passed a no-confidence vote in the unity government. And while it was rejected by the upper house, it was still a massive blow to the country's search for peace. But at Thursday's conference, Libya's foreign minister said a free and fair election was crucial for the country's stability, and the UN has pledged its support. We are interested in democracy and in encouraging free and honest elections that guarantees the participation of all people. We call on all Libyans to accept the election results. Those are the foundations of long-term stability. We should ensure that elections lead to a greater unification of Libya institutions. We will continue supporting this process that should lead to a unified government and a unified parliament. So is Libya ready for elections? Well, to discuss that, I'm joined from Tripoli by Salah al-Bakush, he was an advisor to Libya's High Council of State's negotiating team. Juma al gamati is in London. He's the head of Libya's Tagir party and was a member of the UN-backed Libyan political dialogue group. Also in the British capital is Tim Eaton, a senior research fellow in Chatham House's Middle East and North Africa program. Thanks all so much for being with us. So it seems the consensus right now uh, at this conference is that elections will happen. Uh, so let's start there. Juma, can Libya really hold elections with no constitutional framework, no solid electoral laws? Unfortunately, if we go into elections without a sound constitutional base or framework and without a strong uh, laws for presidential and parliamentarian elections, laws which have been agreed by the over, uh, overwhelming majority of stakeholders in Libya, uh, the, uh, laws which have been an accord uh, and a consensus on, if, if we do not do that, then I, I, I fear that those elections will not go very well. Uh, 
the credibility uh, of those elections will be undermined. The results of these elections might be contested highly. Uh, and, and in a state of polarization and conflict and division, it's very easy of, for one party or the other to actually uh, not go along with, 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 any, uh, with, with any results. Let, uh, uh, mindful as well of the fact that um, can we really hold fair and free elections, transparent elections? Can everybody com campaign freely, especially in areas in the East and the South, which are under total control of uh, 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 security control of Haftar and his and his mm. military groups or his militias? So uh, I think the debate has been very lively, very strong in Libya over the last few weeks about the need for a strong constitutional base and the need for strong laws, which everybody buys into, which have been a result of good consensus and good accord. Unfortunately, we haven't got that. So okay. I was looking to the international community to interfere and to to help, but it looks like uh, they, they, they are not paying much attention. They're just letting the head of the HOR, Aguila Saleh, run the show, and he's the one who imposed unilaterally these laws, and he's the one who actually totally ignored the uh, Berlin one, Berlin two, and Geneva track, which was supposed to come up with the with the constitutional base. So okay, uh, Juma, I, just I'm very doubtful, quickly, although... very very quickly, are you saying that if, for example, these elections are somehow forced through, it could actually make the situation in Libya worse? I think, uh, in the words of, uh, I'm not sure whether it's Tim or another Europe, European Libya uh, specialist who said, these elections could actually be uh, one step forward and two steps backwards. Okay. Yes. So there is that danger. We might regress. Uh, we might make the situation even worse because of hurrying. However, I don't want to sound to be against elections. I'm, I'm, I'm heading a political party. I believe in the democratic discourse, and I strongly believe in elections. But we want Under to so have they just strong, need to be done strong right. And sound elections that will move us forward and not regress us back. Absolutely. Okay, Sala, uh, when we hear the Prime Minister say that he believes this country will absolutely have the election infrastructure by place somehow by December 24th, is he saying that because he has to or does he genuinely believe it? I, I don't know. Uh, either way, I, 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 I don't think it's, uh, it's something that's very believable. I mean, look, 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 look at this. Uh, the Prime Minister is responsible for securing the elections. The Prime Minister was unable to land in the second largest city in the country, Benghazi. Few days ago, he was prevented by Haftar again from landing in the, uh, one of the major cities in the south, Ghat. So how could he uh, for, uh, enforce security for the elections? When the prime minister that's responsible for that function cannot even go to two thirds of the country. So the, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to believe that elections can happen. Uh, look, I mean, if our elections going to happen, I doubt it. We are two months away. We have no laws, no uh, constitutional basis. And we are not even discussing security and uh, uh, let alone uh, really providing security for the uh, upcoming elections. Uh, are they going to happen? I doubt it. Should they happen? I think uh, at this time, uh, uh, nobody, uh, nobody knows that... Uh, if they should happen. At least there is a big doubt about the presidential elections, since they're going to be a zero-sum uh, uh, competition. And we know with the history of the developing world, the, uh, the, uh, 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 how uh, presidents uh, like to monopolize power. And in Libya, uh, nobody's going to accept Haftar. Uh, a lot of people are not going to accept Haftar as president. They're not going to accept safe as president, and others would not accept it, Beba or somebody that's right. uh, pro-West uh, uh, or something that, uh, as president. I want to so talk more the, about these so specific... So the, the matter is, is very complicated, and I think, I think all in all... I, I want to, sorry, yeah, Salah, I want to talk uh, more specifically... Just one final point. Uh, all in all, uh, what's going what's, what's to happen, what's going to happen is probably nothing uh, uh, going to happen if the elections don't uh, are not held on time. Okay, I do want to talk more uh, specifically about the potential candidates, Saif al-Islam, the son of Muammar Gaddafi, as well as uh, Khalifa Haftar. I want to approach that in just a minute, but uh, first let me just ask Tim, I mean, is, is it just a matter of needing some extra time 
for the logistics in order to get the election together, or are there truly fundamental issues that need to be addressed and repaired before any such thing can go forward? Well, I think it's important to look at the process which got us here. In many ways, it's been a focus on process itself. Libya needs a transitional government to get through to elections. And after those elections, there will be a government that will be accepted across the, the country and will then be able to make the changes that are required. Now, in many ways, that sounds like it makes sense. But the problem is that it means that all of the substantive issues that really people are, are fighting about, whether that's the distribution of resources to different parts of the country, whether that's holding political office, have all been up for grabs. And that's really meant that you've had this kind of 3D game of chess, where all of the, all of the actors involved have been trying to control the outcome by shaping the process in their interests. And that's meant that we haven't really seen much progress until the uh, House of Representatives gambit to release the presidential elections law without a vote on the floor, which then received a kind of muted response from the internationals and is now kind of becoming the contested basis for the elections. And we also have contested parliamentary elections laws. Okay. So I think unfortunately, it's, it's, it's inevitable that because the system is set that whoever prevails at these elections will get to decide mm. the future of the country, everybody is positioning and trying to shape that process in, in their own, uh, in accordance with their own best interests. You know, Tim, it's interesting because back in February when the Libyan political dialogue forum got underway, uh, you pointed out that the process then was geared toward a power sharing formula rather than political reconciliation. That's still a huge problem, is it not? There is still a need for the reconciliation really before anything can properly get done. Yes, and I think it's fair to say that um, I was surprised by the way that the, the current government and national unity came together. But the fundamental reason that I think it was able to was because there were enough deals made with enough of the actors and not sufficient enough threat was posed by the GNU for people to back it. Over time, that consensus has really started to become diluted, and now we're seeing it break open with a deputy prime minister of the GNU raise major issues against the standing prime minister and the distribution of resources. So, yes, you're right. The, the GNU was always meant to kind of be a sticking plaster to get through to um, elections, and then following that point, right. there, was, there is a government emerging. But that process didn't allow for the actual airing of grievances for meaningful negotiations about how Libya should be governed. So those still haven't really taken place. And the gap between the various actors is big on these mm. issues and won't be resolved by one poll or two polls in December. Right. And the other issue, uh, Juma, I'll come back to you uh, at this point, um, is about the potential candidates if and when this election is held. Um, some are mentioning Saif al-Islam, the return of, of Muammar Gaddafi's son uh, to the political fore. There's also, of course, Khalifa Haftar. Um, these are extremely polarizing characters uh, in Libyan politics. Do you think they genuinely stand a chance of, of candidacy? Well, I think the presidential law, which um, Aguila Saleh, head of HOR, has passed, was designed in a way to allow Khalifa Haftar to stand. I mean, they omitted the condition that uh, they should not be military personnel and they should resign from their military job completely before they stand. And they omitted the condition that they should not have dual, national, uh, dual citizenship. And Khalifa Haftar is well known to be an American citizen. So they, they omitted those two criteria or conditions conditions deliberately so that Khalifa Haftar can stand. And Khalifa Haftar has already started campaigning and he thinks uh, he's popular and he will win. Now, that is that is obviously uh, contested. I personally and many others believe that he has no chance in hell to win. He will not gain majority. He might falsify elections in the East and the South where he controls everything. And he might uh, give himself uh, overwhelming majority in the East and the South. But, but then demographically, the East and the South count 
account for less than 30% of the overall population. And he cannot mess around with elections in the West where nearly 70% of the population are residing. So I don't think he has a chance. Uh, and and it was, it's, going, it's going to be a catastrophe for a, for a war criminal, for a, a warlord like Haftar, who has been primarily and mainly responsible for all the divisions, all the civil wars, the, the war on Tripoli, the mass graves and the huge war crimes in Tarhuna and so on, uh, and, and let alone the crimes in the East, in Benghazi and the whole of the, to be allowed to actually to become the president. Extremely divisive. He will not be accepted by the overall majority, overwhelming, overwhelming majority of the people in the West, and they will just close shop and say, sorry, you're not coming. You're not coming to Tripoli. You're not going to be our president. You should, you should stand trial for all your war crimes. So that's after. Uh, mm -hmm. As for as for Saif al-Islam al-Gaddafi, we don't even know where he is. Uh, 10 years now, we haven't had any audio or visual message from him to confirm that he's still alive. He might be alive somewhere in a town in the western mountain close to the um, Algerian border, uh, but, we, we, but there's no confirmation of that. Also, he has been indicted uh, by, 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 by the, the Libyan high court in Tripoli, and, and this is a, a serious uh, condition. If, if somebody's been indicted, indicted for crimes, then they cannot stand for election. So it, it's very doubtful okay. that uh, that Saif al-Islam would stand. He might he might come out in a statement if he is alive and support or sponsor somebody else on his behalf as a candidate. And I think still they will have a very little chance of winning or, or gaining overall, uh, overall okay. majority to become uh, president. Salah, let me find out if you're at least on the same page there. Well, n not exactly, but not to the point where I will roll my eyes. But, but any, anyways, uh, look, uh, the candidates that have announced so far, you know, Haftar and, uh, and Bashara and uh, possibly uh, Dbeiba and uh, Arif al Naid, the former ambas Libyan ambassador to the UAE, who is very close to the UAE, uh, uh, make it uh, very unlikely that anyone would win in the first round. Then the question becomes, is Haftar, if he doesn't win in the first round and he doesn't score big and doesn't think he has potential of winning the second round, is he going to allow a second round? Mm -hmm. Is there going to be a second round uh, uh, in Libyan elections? So that's a big question. And I think uh, 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 we can be assured that there will be enough people that will oppose Haftar if, should he win and there are enough people that will oppose, uh, oppose uh, safe should he win. And there are enough people that will oppose Bashara or, uh, or Dbeiba uh, should they win to make the uh, election results unacceptable uh, nationwide and will be back in, uh, to square one. That's the problem with the, with the presidential elections. We are seeing, as a matter of fact, we are seeing a replay of what happened after the Sherat Agreement in 2015. The same people that opposed the Sherat Agreement and they uh, may, uh, shredded the whole thing are now doing the same thing with the uh, Geneva Agreement and the roadmap. So uh, without, with, without really changing the formula and sitting down and discussing what Tim talked about. The, 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 core, uh, the core issue in the conflict of Libya is who controls the money. Unless we resolve that, nothing is going to be resolved. Okay. Tim, uh, let me ask you, I can, I can see you agreed with a lot of what Salah said. Um, we know Libya wants to establish, desperately to establish its own sovereignty, but we can't underestimate the role and the influence of, of foreign powers in Libya. It is the ultimate proxy war. So what do you think the role of foreign powers could be going into this potential election? Well, I think as Juma pointed out, we are not really even meeting the basic threshold for being able to hold the poll. Now that doesn't mean that a poll um, should be abandoned right now. And I think it's very important that some kind of um, vote is, is enacted, but it has to meet those basic thresholds. There has to be buy-in by the respective rivals to respect the result in, the, in advance. There has to be a consensus over the rules of the game. I think there's a degree of pragmatism required in that these polls are never going to be perfect, mm. but at least has to meet those thresholds and it has to be compliant with what was agreed um, and passed in Security Council 
um, resolutions. And I think an important point here is that blame goes around a long way because everybody's deviating from the playbook of the Security Council resolutions. And the UN isn't even backing up its own decisions on this or trying to adjudicate. So clearly, if there's going to be progress, the internationals, principally the UN, has to try and enforce that plan and at least, for example, get a vote on any legislation that's passed through the HOR. There has to be at least these basic um, levels. And of course, there are international interests at play, and that's going to make it easier for some actors to oppose or spoil a process. But unless you have those parameters in place about what the process is, then frankly, the opposition to what comes out of these elections will be legitimate in many senses, because it's unlikely that there's going to be any due process to have been followed. Mm. And that mm. is is the principal point that we have now and I think should be the focus of the international community. OK, you know what, Tim, we're down to our last five minutes. So I need to ask you this because Libya is a very complicated country. It's very difficult to understand for people that aren't uh, studying it rather closely. Tell us, if you can, why is Libya so uniquely difficult to govern? Is it tribal? Is it the terrain? Is it the curse of natural resources? Is it the legacy of 40 years of dictatorship unraveling or all of the above? I think many, you've mentioned many things there. Clearly, um, what we've really seen since 2011 is an accelerated process of fragmentation in Libya. And I think, you know, it's not there's no clear power center or, or set of actors that dominates over the others. There's a balance of power and, ba and power has been relatively local. And that's meant that there are a lot of actors to buy into any deal. There's a need for a, so a new social contract, a new consensus over how Libya is, is run and governed that Libyans can get on board with. There's a need for that conversation. And that conversation has been sadly rather lacking in a lot of the um, localized conflict and the support of local actors by international players who haven't played, um, let's face it, a very uh, constructive role. Okay. So absolutely. So there needs to be there needs to be a focus on a process which can actually allow the discussion of the substantive issues rather than just believing one poll mm. um, will create somehow magically create a process that can fix all these things. Okay. There needs to be. A let me ask our Libyan panelists. I mean, Juma, I can start with you. I, I want to ask you why you believe, why you think this country is so uniquely difficult to govern. Uh, because of the legacy of the 42 years, there has been no uh, polity. People were not allowed to develop politically, to develop political parties, civil society, political and democratic culture. So it's a it's a rentier economy. It's a rentier state. People believe that the state is the main or the only supplier of money and wealth. So it, they have to compete and grab for it. But more importantly, after, after the 2011, we were in a vacuum. Libya was going to be reshaped again politically, economically, so Socially, and many uh, outside actors, regional and international, wanted actually to shape Libya in their own mold so that they benefit uh, from Libya and, and get what they want uh, out of Libya in terms of their interest. And that is why the regional and international actors, some of them at least, have been fueling uh, conflict, uh, uh, fueling uh, uh, the, the wars, hoping that their, whoever their stooge or their, or their, uh, uh, their agent in Libya can actually uh, uh, over, uh, overtake or, or win and take over power completely and, and turn Libya into their advantage. So in a way, that the conference today okay. is, is, is really strange because those actors who are sitting in Tripoli, they, some of them are the main reason for the instability. They are actually destabilizing factors, and yet they are talking about stability of Libya. That's the problem. The international community, is. A, uh, we've seen many of these conferences as a talking shop, but when it comes to action, when it comes to follow-up, these countries don't actually turn their, their words into deeds. What Juma? they do, what they say above the table, they do exactly the opposite under the table. And right. that is the worrying factor, and that uh, will continue uh, making Libya instable unless there is a new I want international resort. to give Salah final words. Salah, just, just a minute and a half. Go ahead. Oh, all right. Uh, okay. I, I, th I think, uh, to, to be short uh, uh, and brief here, uh, I think it's the issue is the money. We avoided talking about the distribution of resources in Sherat, and I was a member of the uh, negotiating team there. 
we avoided talking about the distribution of resources uh, during the constitution process and they spent three years and at the end there was no discussion of the money because they don't want uh, uh, any disagreements. And now in, in, uh, in Geneva, we avoided discussion of the resources issue. And so, so far, if we continue with that, there will be a lot of foreign powers that will capitalize on the grievances regarding resources and will pull this party here and that party here and so on and and the issue and the conflict will continue unless we resol we reach an economic agreement i don't think that we have any chance of progressing salal bakush juma gamati tim eaton thank you all so much for being with us on this edition of the newsmakers and thanks of course to our viewers for being with us as well remember you can follow us on twitter at the underscore newsmakers and be sure to subscribe to our youtube channel i'm andrea sankey we'll see you next time